Welcome to the Law School Insider, where we have conversations with students, lawyers, and employers. Succeeding in law school is something that you must prepare for, not only before you begin, but throughout your law school journey, and that's what this podcast is all about. I am your host, Dr. Christopher Lewis, and I will draw from my over 20 years of experience in the college admission field, as well as bring forth the experiences of others as we delve deeper into the issues. I'm Ashley Heidemann. I'm the founder of JD Advising. I graduated from Wayne State University Law School in 2010. I got a 182 on the Michigan Bar Exam in 2011. I love the Michigan Bar Exam. I'm one of the few people who really love the Bar Exam. And I've also discovered that there are a lot of ways to really study efficiently for the Bar Exam so that you don't have to, you know, you're not basically, um, oh, hello. There's a way, there's ways to study efficiently for the bar exam so that you're not um, making a, a mistakes that a lot of first time takers make when they sit for the bar exam. And we're going to talk about that today. And I will give you a handout. <laughs> Looks like it's going to be an all live class. <laughs> all, Thank you. all distance up. Are you going to post the. Um that handout that you're giving out? Yes, you know, um, I don't have an electronic version right now, but it will be posted later so that you guys can all access it. So for now, I would take notes, and I'll kind of, I'll put some things up on, like, the screen so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, hello. But I would, um, I would just download it later so you have all the information. Um, a little bit about what I'm going to be talking about today is we're going to talk about what the Michigan Bar Exam is. And then we're going to talk about the MBE portion of the bar exam, the essay portion of the bar exam. And uh, lastly, I'll talk a little bit about what JD Advising does and a little bit about my company so that you have that too. Okay. So let's just talk a, about a brief overview of what the bar exam is to begin with. And sorry, my PowerPoint is, for some reason, the font doesn't work well with all computers, so it looks a little bit, it's not perfect, but that's okay. Um, so a brief overview of what the bar exam is. Basically, the Michigan bar exam is broken down into an essay portion and a multiple choice portion. The essay portion is completely specific to Michigan. So it's, you know, you have to know Michigan law. Uh, people sometimes ask, like, should I apply common law or should I talk about common law? And the answer is generally no. Just talk about Michigan law on the Michigan essay portion of the bar exam. There are 15 essay questions on the essay portion of the bar exam. You have five hours to complete them. So you'll have three hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. You should spend about 20 minutes per question. And there are 24 subjects that could be tested on the essay portion. And we'll talk about what these subjects are in a lot more depth in a minute. Each essay question is worth 10 points. And if you get a score of seven, that's generally considered to be a passing score. So if you get a score of seven, you're in the pass range. Below seven, you're technically not passing, and anything above seven is, is scoring high on the essay portion. The MBE portion, as you can see from the slide, is six hours of multiple choice, of basically 200 multiple choice questions. Um, it's a national test, so the MBE is the same everywhere. It's the same in Michigan, it's the same in every state that administers the MBE. There are now 175 scored questions as of this February. And there's seven subjects tested. And I've listed them there, Civ Pro, Con Law, Crim Law, Crim Pro, Contract, Sales, Real Property, Evidence, Torts. And we'll talk about these in more depth in a minute. If you're wondering the kind of score that you should be aiming for on the MBE, if you get about a 60% to 70% correct, that's usually passing. Um, a 60% will usually get you a score of 135, which is a passing score. I always say, obviously, you want to aim higher. But sometimes people freak out if they're only getting a 60, 65% when technically that's a passing score. Is everybody here taking the July bar exam? The upcoming bar exam? Okay. For July, if you're taking the July bar exam, it'll be in the Breslin Center. If you want to, just two tips for the July in particular. If you want to stay right where the bar exam is held, you want to stay at the Kellogg Center. And I would book like now because it fills up quickly. And um, not everybody wants to stay where the bar exam is held. Some people want to get away and stay, you know, far away from the bar exam, which is fine. The advantage, though, of staying closer to where the bar exam is held is you don't have to worry about parking. Sometimes parking takes people an hour in the morning, um, and it's a big hassle. 
So they'd just rather stay right at the Kellogg Center and then walk, you know, next door to where the exam's being held, basically. But my advice is to book now. My advice is also the July bar exam, the Bresden Center, is freezing cold. Um, my company is sometimes there. We give out, like, pens and pencils and things. And the very first thing to go every July is hand warmers and foot warmers because it's freezing cold. So I would bring layers and, and bring, uh, bring things to stay warm. A lot of people don't think about it in July because they assume July is going to be warm, and it's not. Um, so just that's an extra tip for you guys. Okay, um, that's kind of just an overview of what the bar exam is. I want to briefly talk about how to pass the bar exam. So there's four things that you really need to do to pass the bar exam. And the reason I like to go over these is because a lot of people will have all these ideas like, oh, you know, um, I have to get these flashcards, or I have to do this course, or I have to do whatever. And really, there's only four things that you need to do to pass the bar exam. And that's it. The first thing that you have to do is get good materials, including good outlines. So you have to have good materials that are tailored to what's tested. Um, you should just use, and if you're following along in the handout here, we're just on page one. Um, you can grab a handout and sign in over there too if you, if you uh, want to follow along. So you need good materials. You need good outlines that you're able to learn from and that reflect the material tested. If you're taking a commercial course like Barbary or Kaplan, then the materials that they usually will give you that you should use are the lecture handouts. And I would just stick with those lecture handouts, you know, fill them in. Don't go crazy. Don't have five outlines that you compare and cross-reference. Um, some people do that. They take, you know, they, they drive themselves crazy. They'll email me about, like, a word discrepancy. It's just easier if you stick to one outline per subject. The next thing that you need to do is understand those materials. Usually you do this by going to lecture. Some people find study group works well for them. Some people already learned it really well in law school, so they don't have to worry about it, you know, so much. They already kind of understand the material for the bar exam, which is nice. The third thing you have to do, and this is what a lot of people skip, is memorize the materials. This is probably the biggest mistake that I see first time takers make, is they have these outlines, they go to lecture, you know, they fill in their lecture handouts, then they go home and they answer problems. But the problem is, is they haven't learned the material in between lecture and answering the problems. And then they get a lot of problems wrong, they're not scoring high in multiple choice, it freaks them out. They start doing 100 multiple choice questions a day, and they don't get better because they never actually learn the law, which is something that you have to do if you want to do well in the bar exam or if you want to pass the bar exam. So I always recommend to make it a point, even if it's not on your to-do list given by your commercial course, um, add it to your to-do list, that after a lecture, instead of just diving into like you know answering a bunch of multiple choice or essay questions, take your outline and make sure that you memorize it. Um, and find whatever strategy works best for you. Some people, like what I used to like to do is to have, I'd have my outline and I would cover up a piece, you know, a page or whatever and see if I could rewrite all the elements of like intentional torts, for example. Um, usually the first time you do that, you're not going to get them right. So you go back, you do it again, and you basically keep doing it until you get everything right. Then you move on to the next section of your outline. And that's what worked really well for me. Um, some people are more auditory. They like to like explain their outline out loud or they like someone to quiz them. Um, but there's, there's different memorization strategies. Um, some people make charts of things. Make sure, though, that you are actually taking the time to memorize the law and learn it really well before you dive into questions, or else you're going to your, make yourself very frustrated. And then the last thing that you want to do is to apply your knowledge to the types of questions that you'll see. Um, and this is multiple choice and essay questions. If you ever hear of people who... Um, graduate really, you know, at the top of their class and fail the bar exam, it's usually because they don't practice enough questions, and usually the ones that they neglect are the essay questions, because the essay questions, you can make so many points up just by practicing, and people who don't practice will try to take a law school approach to bar exam essays, which doesn't work, um, and they end up not doing well in the bar exam for that reason. So make sure that you're practicing enough essay and multiple choice questions. And really, I mean, this is kind of just an overview of how to pass the bar exam, but this is what you need to do. You need good materials, you need to understand them, memorize them, and then apply your knowledge, and you will be, you will be on track to pass. And anything that doesn't further one of those four goals, you shouldn't be doing. Um, so if something you're doing doesn't help you, then stop doing it, because it has to further one of these four goals in order to help you pass the bar exam. Okay. 
So now I want to talk a little bit about the essay portion of the bar exam, and then we'll move into the MBE. And again, I'm sorry about the PowerPoint being a little bit off. So for the essay portion of the bar exam, and then kind of if you're if you're following along in the handout, I kind of back I'm backing up off the handout. We'll just look at the slides, and then um, it's all in the handout though. All the information is there. There are 24 potential essay subjects that could be tested on the bar exam. So this is obviously a lot of essay subjects um, that could be tested. And people often ask me like, there's these 24 subjects. Are any of them tested more than others? Like, do I really have to know all 24 subjects equally? Or are there some that are tested more frequently that I should be even more aware of? And the answer is, is there are some subjects that are tested more than others. So you do not have to know all 24 subjects equally. And in fact, if you look at this chart, the ones in pink font are tested much more than the ones in blue font, okay, in terms of the essay subjects. So you can see like civil procedure, constitutional law, contract sales, crim law, crim pro, evidence, real property must be under evidence. Um, it's cut off from the slide. Torts, these are all tested very heavily, very frequently. Domestic relations, which is the same thing as family law, is tested basically every exam. Same with personal property, same with corporations, same with workers' compensation and professional responsibility, and then wills or trusts. These are tested basically you know, every single exam. Before 2016, the Board of Law Examiners kind of picked between these subjects. Like, they would just rotate them, they'd, they would pick, they'd kind of all look, be these subjects in pink font, and then occasionally they would test one from the left column. They might test agency, partnership, equity. Like, occasionally they'd add something. But usually it was very standard, they, and they only tested the ones in pink font. And that's where they got their 15 questions on the essay portion of the bar exam. In 2016, they changed that. So in 2016, instead of just testing these subjects in pink font, they started testing, instead of all 15 being like these more highly tested subjects, they started testing 12 highly tested subjects and then adding in three of these more unusual subjects. So they started actually giving more like curveballs in terms of the subjects that were tested on the Michigan bar exam. And if you just kind of like look at the slide, you can see, um, you know, like some of the ones that are not tested as much, agency, partnership, equity, these have all been showing up more recently. Um, agency was tested both exams in 2016, but before that it was last tested in July 2006, so they waited like 10 years to test agency. Partnership we predicted was coming up this last February, in February 2017, and it did. The last time they tested partnership though was February 2007, so they waited 10 years to test it. Um, equity, they tested in July 2016. They also tested it in July 2011, so they waited about five years to test equity. Both exams tested the exact same issue, preliminary injunctions. No-fault insurance, they tested in July 2016. Before that, it was July 2014. Before that, February 2011. Before that, 2010. The last eight times they've tested no-fault, they've tested the exact same topic every single time, which is non-economic damages, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Conflicts of law, they just tested in February. Um, and they tested last February as well, so they tested February 2017, February 2016. Before that, though, it was July 2008, so they waited a long time to test conflicts. Secure transactions, they test occasionally. The last time they tested it was February 2016. I have a feeling it could be coming up for July. Uh, just to warn you, I would study secure transactions. Commercial paper and negotiable instruments has only been tested once in February 2010. I'm a little worried that that one might make a comeback too. And then one that's missing off the page, but it's in your handout, um, is creditor's rights. It's just at the bottom, it got cut off. Um, and creditor's rights was just tested in February 2017. We actually thought creditor's rights might be coming up. It was a weird garnishments question. It was still a very hard question for people to answer though. So, you know, you've heard me say a couple things. You've heard me say that there's 24 essay subjects and you've also heard me say that, you know, typically they test these ones in pink font, but lately they've been testing these ones in blue font. And what does that mean for you in terms of how you study for the bar exam? Like, what's the takeaway? Do you still have to know everything? And the takeaway is even when they test a more unusual exam, so even if they have three of these more unusual subjects, like, for example, they, if they test, like, agency, partnership, and equity or something, Still, 12 of the 15 subjects, or 80% of the essay exam, is very standard in terms of what's tested. So you still have to focus on the highly tested subjects, because it, 
no matter what, even if they've thrown some more unusual subjects, they've never thrown in, you know, ten unusual subjects. They've done three maximum. So you still have to focus on the highly tested subjects. When they do test unusual subjects, you know, should you be kind of, like, sad about it? Is that good or bad for you guys that you'll probably see three unusual subjects on your exam? And it's actually good, and it's good for two reasons. The first reason that it's good is because when they test an unusual subject, the topic that they test tends to be very standard. So if you look back on like what was tested last July, in July 2016, they tested these kind of like 12 of the more normal subjects, quote unquote, and then their weird subjects were agency, equity, and no-fault insurance. So agency, they tested July 2016, they basically tested the exact same concepts that they tested in February 2016. So it was like very easy for anybody who had looked back on those practice questions. Um, equity, they tested in July 2016. It was the exact same issue that they tested in July 2011. So anybody who had been looking back on practice exams, that would have been a very easy question for them to answer. And no-fault insurance, they tested in July 2016. It was not economic damages, which is the same issue they've tested the last eight times they've tested no-fault insurance. So anybody who bothered to look back at any no-fault insurance questions was at an advantage um, in answering that question. So even though, like last July, had some kind of unusual subjects, the topics were very standard. And I would take some unusual subjects with standard topics any day um, over like a standard subject with a really hard question. You know, so I think it's actually good if you get some more unusual subjects tested. The other reason that it's good to have an exam that has a couple unusual subjects is because they have a generous curve when they test these subjects. I won't go into the details of the Michigan essay scaling and how they curve essays. They don't tell anyone anyway, so it's mostly speculation. But I will tell you this. In 2015 and before, they would scale everyone's essays by just adding a certain number of points to everyone's score. So like, for example, they would add between 32 and 36 points to everyone's essay score, and you'd see if you got that 135, which is a passing score. So they'd add between 32 and 36 points. In 2016, when they started testing some of these more unusual subjects, like if you look at February 2016, for example, instead of adding between 32 and 36 points, they added between 40 and 48 points to everyone's score. That's a huge curve. That's like having a bonus question and a half for some people. Um, and they generally add more points the higher you score. So if you score higher, you'd get 48 points added to your score. If you score low, you get 40 points added to your score. And that, that's how they create this kind of like curve. So that was actually a huge advantage for people who were studying the essays and who did well in the essay portion. They would get these outrageous essay scores. And we had people, like, in my essay class, I told a couple people in my essay class, you're not going to pass the bar exam because your MBE score is too low. Like, they were scoring really low in multiple choice, um, like bottom fifth percentile. And I said that, you know, it's going to be really hard to make up an essay score to make up for that low of a multiple choice score and still pass the exam. And the people that I told that to all passed, and they all passed because they got these really high essay scores because they were aware of these highly tested issues um, and they approach the essay exam in an intelligent way. So it can really be a huge strength if you make it into a strength um, on the bar exam. Sometimes people ask if we were surprised that, you know, were we surprised at all that these kind of like unusual subjects were tested in 2016 um, and that they're still being tested today. And we actually weren't surprised. We told people we were worried they, they were going to start testing more unusual subjects. The reason that we weren't surprised was because in 2015, they, the Board of Law Examiners put a little notice on their website, and it was under breaking news, and it said, breaking news, uh, examinees must know all of the laws listed in Rule 3 for the bar exam. And I thought, okay, well, Rule 3 must have changed because everybody's always had to know all the subjects listed in Rule 3. But when I looked at Rule 3, it hadn't changed. It was exactly the same. And that told me they were going to start testing some of these more unusual subjects and sure enough, they did. And that notice is still on their website. So I think it, it means they're still in that mode of like testing these more non-traditional subjects on the bar exam. OK. Any questions on that? 
Okay, perfect. Um, if you're following along in the handout and you just go to page four, um, I want to make a couple of notes and I'll put something on the screen so that everyone can kind of follow along. Okay, so um, if we go to page four, I'm not going to talk about this in a, in a ton of depth. I'm just going to point out a couple issues. And for those who are, you know, watching from afar, this handout will be uploaded to for you guys so that you have it. Um, right now, I would just take notes on a separate piece of paper. So basically, I want to point out that not only are some subjects highly tested on the essay portion of the bar exam, you know, you'll see some subjects over and over. You'll also see some topics over and over and over again on the bar exam. And what are these topics? We're not going to go through all of these. I just want to put, make a couple points on, this, on the handout. So, for example, if we start with criminal law, they like to test homicide, they like to test aiding and abetting, and they like to test robbery. Homicide is not only highly tested on the essay portion, it's also three to five questions on the MBE. So you want to know homicide pretty well for the bar exam. You could get a potential of a lot of points for knowing that area of law really well. Aiding and abetting is the same thing as accomplice liability. And aiding and abetting or accomplice liability is something that's been very heavily and frequently tested on the Michigan Bar Exam. I thought it might have been coming up in February, but it didn't. Um, so now I think it could be coming up in July. And since they're the exact same, aiding and abetting and accomplice liability are the same, but Michigan uses this language, aiding and abetting, and we have our own like three-part test for what aiding and abetting is and I would memorize this three-part test for the Michigan essays because that's what they're going to want to see on the exam. Robbery is very highly tested on the essay portion of the exam. We predicted it would come up in February, and it did. You should know that there is a big difference between common law robbery and Michigan robbery, and I put it on the handout so you guys can study that. When they test robbery, they test this, this nuance and this distinction. Criminal procedure tends to test three things over and over again. They like search and seizure, they like Miranda rights, and they like the confrontation clause. I'm a little bit worried that the confrontation clause could be coming up. Um, they tested the confrontation clause in July 2012, July 2013, July 2014. The judge that wrote the question in July 2012 was mad because nobody knew the answer. Everybody got it wrong. Everybody did this like evidence analysis to this criminal procedure question. And so I think that's why he tested it two more Julys in a row. And honestly, I think it's due time to come up again. That judge was reappointed to the board, so I expect to see it in some kind of upcoming exam. The other thing to note about the confrontation clause is it's not considered to be an evidence question. A lot of people think, like, oh, confrontation clause, that's evidence, because you learn it in evidence in law school, and uh, most bar exam courses will teach it with evidence. But on the Michigan bar exam, it's, all, it's actually considered to be a criminal procedure question. And so on the Michigan bar exam, if you see a confrontation clause issue, don't write, like, this is an evidence question, because they want you to be thinking it's crim pro, um, and they're going to expect a criminal procedure analysis. <clears throat> There's a couple um, different areas of law with contracts. You can, if you flip the page, you can also see sales. We're not going to talk about all of these um, in torts and um, evidence. I do want to make a couple notes about, um, about torts. The first thing I want to note about torts is negligence is very highly tested on the Michigan bar exam. They like duty owed to an invitee. So for the Michigan bar exam, you should learn negligence and learn premises liability very well. Duty owed to an invitee is one of their favorite things to test. Um, that's been you can see all the dates that it's been tested. I've listed them there for you. You should also um, know, the, know this very well for the MBE, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Governmental immunity is about one in every four questions on the torts on the bar exam for torts. Just so you know, if you take a commercial course, to my knowledge, they do not talk about Michigan governmental immunity at all, and that goes for all the major commercial courses. Um, if I'm wrong, someone please correct me, but so far they have not taught it at all. And Michigan governmental immunity is one in every four torts questions, so you do want to know it um, for the bar exam. So there's a couple different options for learning it. You can go back and look at some of these past exams. I put the dates for you. You can Google the Michigan Government Tort Liability Act. Um, 
and kind of learn it from there. I also have a seminar, which is in July, and normally it's $500. Cooling students get a discount of $300, and we'll talk about the highly tested areas of law and also predictions for what I think is coming up. And we'll go over governmental immunity in depth in that seminar because that's something that I think everybody should know going into the bar exam in case they test it. Assault and battery are also highly tested intentional torts on the torts question. One thing to note about assault and battery is when they tested this in July 2015, and they tested this many times, it's their favorite intentional tort, they never test trespass or anything like that, or at least they haven't been, they stick with like assault and battery when they do intentional torts. Um, and when they tested this last time, in July 2015, everybody was so happy. They said like, oh, I don't know how I did on the bar exam, but I know I got a 10 on that assault and battery question, and they were like thrilled to see it. But really what we found was people who thought they did really well on the assault and battery question didn't do well because they couldn't articulate the elements well enough. You know, and because it's a highly tested issue, this is especially important to memorize this law well in case you see it. So like people would say things like assault is, you know, when the uh, plaintiff tries to scare someone, you know, they'd have these kind of like weak definitions or weak rule statements. Um, and even if they got the answer right, they'd still get like a score of six, which isn't passing, or even five sometimes. And this is something where you should be able to say like, an assault doesn't act with intent to cause a harmful or offensive contact or imminent apprehension of that contact, and a harmful or offensive contact, or I'm sorry, or imminent apprehension of that contact directly or indirectly results. You should be able to kind of like spit off the definition of assault um, so that if you see it in a bar exam essay, you can get those points. And again, especially since this is highly tested, you can see all the dates it's been tested on the bar exam. So when it's a kind of an easier question, they tend to grade a little harder. Evidence, they like hearsay. Um, it's been a, they like uh, hearsay convictions for impeachment and mimic. The evidence question has been uh, tricky lately, and the grader has been hard for evidence. The last evidence question in February 2017 was the last question of the morning portion. It was a page and a half long, and people struggled with it, and that's kind of been typical of evidence questions recently. Constitutional law, there's two ways they go with constitutional law. They'll either test something they've tested in the past, that's what they did in February, and they do, it, they do it occasionally. If they test something, an issue they've tested in the past, like if they test commercial speech, if they test school speech, you know, the first category of free speech, you should get high scores on those. If they test the equal protection clause, especially because they've done it in the same ways, you know, over and over again, you should get a high score on the equal protection clause question. If they test the dormant commerce clause, which is honestly what I'm hoping for in July, um, nobody likes the Dormant Commerce Clause, but it's very standard in terms of how they test it. Their analysis is very standard. It's been tested quite a bit on the essays, and it would be an easy 10 if you saw it. So sometimes they'll test these standard topics. Um, a lot of times for constitutional law, they will give something, they will give you something very weird. And this happens like at least usually once a year, where they give somebody a question that they don't have any idea of how to answer. Um, last July, they did a cruel and unusual punishment Eighth Amendment question. A lot of people didn't even talk about the Eighth Amendment. Uh, the July before that, they did this government speech question, which no, almost nobody knew. They did uh, a Second Amendment question, which a lot of people struggled with. Even, even my gun owning students struggled with it. So sometimes they just do these really hard questions that nobody knows where they come from or what to say. And... Um, you know, like last July 2015, they did this public speech, public employee speech, government speech question. It was hard. People didn't really know what to say. And um, once the bar exam was over, and people would fail it, of course, and come to me to look at their essays for appeal purposes. Um, and I noticed that people took one of two approaches to this constitutional law question that nobody knew how to answer. One approach was, you know, like somebody walked into my office, her answer was two sentences long, and um, she got a score of one or two on the question. And I said, why is your answer only two sentences long? You know, did you run out of time, or what happened? She said, no, I didn't run out of time. I just didn't know how to answer it, so I'm not going to waste time on a question that I have no idea what to say. I'm going to spend my time on a question that I actually think I'd get points on, which is logical in some ways. You know, like, might as well spend your time where you're going to maximize your points. Um, then the other approach, and I saw another guy kind of take this approach, is 
he came in my office. He also was just getting his assets evaluated for an appeal. And I read his, or I looked at his constitutional law question. It was two pages long. It was lengthy. Um, he talked about, you know, public forum, private forum, content-based, content-neutral speech, all kinds of things. And um, none of it was accurate, and none of it was relevant, and none of it was in the model answer. And he got a five on that question. And some people would even get a six for that type of answer. And so even though they both had answers that were crappy and that didn't have anything in the model answer in them, because it was a hard question, it's almost like the grader you know, gave more points for effort, and, um, or they didn't want to read the answer, I don't know, one or the other. But they gave more points to somebody who literally didn't say anything in the model answer, but who, who wrote a long answer anyway. And that's been consistent. Even last July when they did the um, like uh, weird con law question on the Eighth Amendment Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause, people did the same thing. Uh, I told all my students, write long answers. And some, some of them didn't even mention the Eighth Amendment at all, which is what the whole question was testing. And they still would pull off fours, fives, or sixes, which is four, five, or six more points than they really deserved on that question. Um, really, they deserve zeros. <laughs> but the point is, is when you get a constitutional law question, even if it's tricky and you have no idea what to say, still write a long answer, you know, throw in some keywords, act, type confidently, and hope that they, you know, they want to give you some points for effort. Uh, because in my experience, they have been giving points for effort, especially if the question's very hard. So I put a couple things in the handout on like, you know, real property, um, civil procedure, they like subject matter jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, in my opinion, should be due time to come up, even though it's not that test tested that often. Um, motion for summary disposition, this is what we thought they'd do last time, and they did. Family law is domestic relations, basically. They test six things over and over again. I've listed them here. I would know those six topics over and over again. If you come to the seminar in July that we have, we'll go over a lot of these issues in much more depth. Um, personal property, they like gifts. They like lost and mislaid property. You should know the Lost and Unclaimed Property Act applies in Michigan. Not all commercial courses teach it, and that's what they want to see on the exam. Um, they also like bailments. And bailments could be coming up. Um, it's usually a pretty tricky question. Corporations, they actually did not test at all in the last year and a half. So if you hate corporations, you might be in luck. They've been testing agency or partnership instead of corporations recently. Workers' compensation, they didn't test in 2016. It made a comeback in February, though, and you can kind of see the types of topics they like to test there. Professional responsibility, they basically tested every single exam. The exception was February, where they did not test professional responsibility. But usually you can expect to see this like ethics question on your exam. They tend to be hard questions. Um, they tend to test a wide range of issues. And honestly, going back and doing questions for professional responsibility usually doesn't help people increase their score. It's kind of a random in terms of what they test, unfortunately. But I would just try to get general ideas of the rule statements to prepare for that question, because you probably will see a PR question. OK, um, just a couple other last, last few ones. Um, I listed wills and trusts, some of the highly tested issues. You can see for these less tested topics, like agency, they do actual parent authority and ratification. That's what they've been testing recently. The creditors' rights, conflicts of laws, they've been doing this, like these uh, tort and conflict issues, kind of like repeatedly, these um, tort, and, tort and contract conflicts issues. They've just been switching back and forth between them. Commercial paper, they've only done once in February 2010. I would study that exam even more than I would, I mean, I would study an outline too, but I would know how to answer that February 2010 question in case it comes up. It'll probably be, the question will probably be similar to that February 2010 question. Partnership, you can kind of see some of the things. They like formation. They like, you know, agency principles. Um, they like, you know, fiduciary duties. For equity, the last two times they've tested equity, it's been these factors for injunctive relief. So this is what you should know. Even if you don't think equity is coming up, like last July, you know, nobody thought equity was coming up. Still, learn the factors for injunctive relief because in case it does come up, you want to, you know, you could get a 10 on that question very easily. It's four things you have to memorize to get a 10 on that question. Uh, no fault insurance, non-economic damages, as I mentioned earlier, are very highly tested. They've tested non-economic damages the last eight times they've tested no fault. It's been tested in a very standard way. 
So if you, you know, look back on past questions, you should be good to go for your standard no-fault question. Secure transactions, they test kind of like more basic issues, I'd say. It's not a typical law school question. Um, they usually test kind of the basics of attachment or perfection. Even people who don't like secure transactions usually don't mind seeing that on the bar exam because it's not super nuanced like it might be if you take a law school class. Still a hard subject though, of course. Okay, let's talk about a couple other Michigan essay tips and then we will move on to the um, MBE portion. So we already kind of talked about focus on the highly tested subject and focus on the highly tested topics within each subject. You want to study smart. People who try to learn every word of every outline and memorize everything about every subject are not studying smart. They usually don't pass and they usually have to take another stab at it where they're actually focusing on the highly tested subjects and highly tested topics. You can definitely study very efficiently by doing that. Um, practice answering essay questions in a timed and untimed setting. You want to practice answering essay questions. Again, this is a big mistake that people make is they won't practice answering essay questions either because they're so worried about the MBE that they don't take the essay portion seriously, then the essay portion ends up screwing them over and they don't pass it and they don't pass the exam. Um, some people also really struggle with timing. And I always say, if you fail the bar exam, fail it because it's hard, not because of a timing issue. If you know you struggle with timing, come up with a plan very early on to make sure that you're on a, you're on a schedule where you practice timed exams. Um, I usually say start with like one hour timed exams, move your way up to two hour, then three hour timed exams, because you don't want timing to be an issue on the real bar exam. Grade your own essays. This is something I tell people very frequently because it's so important um, and it can help you increase your score significantly. So when you write an essay question, instead of just you know, writing your answer and then handing it in for someone to look at, which is fine, it's not bad to hand it in to anybody and you should hand it in because some people can see things that you might not see. But instead of just handing in your essay question, take time to compare your answer to the examiner's analysis or the model answer. And you don't have to say all the citations or policy reasons or whatever that they might give in the model answer, but take time, compare your answer to the model answer, make sure your rule statements are the same, your application of the law is the same, and that your conclusions are the same. And if you didn't get something right, like if you got a rule statement wrong, write it out or type it out in a different color font or different color pen and you know, write out what the rule statement is or what you missed or if you formatted something wrong, literally pretend you're a grader for your own essay. Um, this is how you get better at the law, especially the law that you're missing. And it's also how you learn to think like a grader. You get in the mind of a grader if you grade your own essay. And you'll, you'll see your essay score improve and your essays improve much you know, more and, and much quick, more quickly than if you just hand it into somebody to look at. And frankly, even though people do a great job, I mean, we grade our students' essays, of course, nobody's more invested in you passing the bar exam than you. So you will give yourself the best feedback that's going to help you the most. I want to talk about, just briefly, how to approach and read an essay fact pattern before we move on to the MBE. Also, you'll see in the, in the handout, there is this beautiful chart of how, when subjects have been tested and how subjects have been tested. So you can kind of, if it helps you to visualize what's tested when, um, the chart will be, will be useful to you. But let's move on to the sales question for July 2016. And this was the, the sales question last July. So I'm just going to read it. We'll take two minutes to talk about how to approach it, and then we'll move on to the MBE. So on May 1st, 2016, ABC Air Conditioning entered into a written contract with Central Supply Inc., CSI, to purchase 500 pounds of liquid freon at $20 per pound. Under the contract, full payment was due by July 22nd, and delivery of the freon was to be made on July 23rd. Delivery costs were to be wholly assumed by the purchaser, ABC. In June 2016, the price of liquid freon plummeted due to a shift in the market. As a result, ABC contacted CSI seeking to modify its contract to reflect a purchase price of $15 per pound. CSI agreed to the price reduction and the modification was reduced to writing. In early July 2016, the price of liquid freon continued to drop. Without seeking consent from CSI, ABC delegated its responsibilities under the contract to another local air conditioning company, XYZ, and assigned its rights under the contract to XYZ. XYZ failed to make any payment to CSI by July 22nd. CSI now seeks your legal advice under Michigan law on the following two questions. 
can ABC legitimately delegate its responsibilities and assign its right under the contract to XYZ without CSI's consent? Explain your answer. And two, can CSI recover the original contract price of $20 per pound? Why or why not? So if you were in law school, you would, if you were answering this as a law school question and you wanted to get a high score, you would start at the top, you would go and you'd issue spot, you'd find all the issues, you'd state the rules, you'd argue both sides, you'd conclude. You know, you'd say, uh, you'd start this essay by probably asking if there's a contract. A contract requires offer acceptance consideration. An offer is a manifestation of willingness to enter into a bargain so made as to justify another and understanding his assent is invited will conclude it. Restatement section 24. In this case, there's an offer because blah, 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 blah. That's how you'd approach a law school question. You start from the top, you dissect it, you go down and um, answer the question. The bar exam is completely different and in some ways it's easier. Um, actually, in a lot of ways, it's easier in law school in terms of it, give, it tells you what to talk about. If you wrote that answer for this bar exam question, first of all, you'd never finish the question because you take forever and you only have 20 minutes per question. But second of all, you would not get a high score because you would never talk about what they actually wanted you to talk about. So what do they want you to talk about in this question? If you go to the very bottom of the question, it's just this part in bold, okay? These are the issues. They tell you the two issues. And I've kind of put them here. The first thing they want you to talk about is delegation and assignment. You know, is it proper for ABC to delegate its responsibilities, assignments, rights without permission from the other party? And the second thing they want you to talk about is whether or not CSI can recover this contract price of $20 per pound. And that is it. They don't want you to talk about contract formation. They don't want you to talk about anything else. They want you to talk about these two issues. And if you talk about these two issues and you talk about them accurately, you should get a high score. So of course, when you go through this question, you have to read the facts carefully. Every fact is in there for a reason. You know, you should be underlining, especially like price, dollar amounts, dates, um, all this kind of thing, because every fact is in there for a reason. I kind of just put a summary of the important dates here. ABC and CSI had a valid contract for 500 pounds of liquid Freon. The price of Freon plummeted then. They modified their contract, so instead of being $20 per pound, it was $15 per pound after there was this market shift. ABC then said, you know what, I'm sick of this contract, I'm delegating it to XYZ. Um, ABC didn't tell CSI. Nobody paid CSI. Uh, CSI was mad, okay, and they want you to answer those two questions about CSI's rights. So, when you see these two questions, you want to structure your whole answer around the questions that they ask you. So what I tell people to do is kind of just follow this formula. They tell you the issues um, that they want, the two issues that they want you to talk about, and for each issue, state what the law is, apply the law to the facts, and conclude. I kind of say like the law states in this case thus. It's like a little, it's like a song. Um, it's also just Iraq, really. They tell you what the issues are, and then you want to state the rule, analyze it, or apply the law, and conclude. And that's it. So that's all they want you to do. It's very formulaic. So in this case, you'd state what the law is. You'd apply it. Another thing is you don't want to argue both sides. Unless they tell you to argue both sides, it's awkward to argue both sides on a bar exam question because there is a right answer that they're looking for, and there's generally not two ways to argue um, a law that clearly applies in one way on the bar exam. So it's different from law school in that way. The other way that is different from law school is that your thus, your conclusion, matters a lot. Um, in law school, a lot of times professors will say, well, like, oh, your conclusion doesn't really matter. You know, we look at your analysis and your rule statements or whatever, um, and we'll give you points if your conclusion makes sense. On the bar exam, your conclusion matters. And in fact, they give a lot of points for an accurate conclusion and they take a lot, a lot of points away if you do not conclude accurately. So they're looking for a specific conclusion, usually, and you should try to arrive at that conclusion. Um, if we kind of just follow this form, format with this answer, with this uh, essay answer, you know, can ABC legitimately delegate its responsibilities and assign its rights under the contract? And generally, parties are allowed to delegate duties and assign rights. That's the first thing you should note. That's kind of like the rule statement. Um, unless, of course, one party has a substantial interest in having the initial party perform. In this case, there was no substantial interest, so the contract can be delegated to um, XYZ. And that's kind of just a short and sweet analysis they were looking for. 
The second issue can CSI recover the original contract price of $20 per pound. Under Article 2, contract modifications made in good faith do not require consideration. In this case, the contract modification was made in good faith because there was a market shift. There's no sign of bad faith. So CSI could recover the modified price of $15 per pound in a suit against ABC. CSI could not recover more than that, though. And that was literally all they were looking for. And some people wrote these long answers. They never really got to the point. And they were kind of looking for this very um, you know, pointed analysis with two very specific conclusions. So a couple, you know, one of the other tips that I give students is because conclusions matter so much on the bar exam, don't write your conclusion first unless you're sure it's correct. Um, and that's a controversial tip as far as bar exam tips go. So you'll hear people say other things than this, but I'm telling you what I see uh, when I study past answers, especially when I'm, we're writing appeals is if somebody gets a conclusion wrong, a lot of points are taken off for that conclusion. Like, for example, if you got the second issue wrong, some graders would just say, that even if you got the rule statement right, you just applied it wrong or you concluded wrong, some graders would say 5 out of 10, they got the second answer wrong. When really, maybe you deserve a 6 or 7 or 8 out of 10 for a decent rule statement or whatever. So what I say is, just put your conclusion at the bottom unless you're sure it's right. That way, you, they have to read through your rule, they have to read through your analysis, Maybe the grader will see that you actually kind of know what you're talking about, even if you get the conclusion wrong. Some people have a habit of doing like a C-rack answer or putting their conclusion first. If they ask the question a certain way, I wouldn't. Just keep your conclusion at the bottom unless you're sure it's right. If you're sure your conclusion is right, then yeah, you can put it at the top and show the grader, give the grader more confidence in your answer right off the bat. Otherwise, I would I would keep your conclusion at the at the bottom of your issue, um, at the bottom of your IRAC rather than moving to anywhere else. Um, also, it's helpful to bold some keywords in law. The people who grade your essays um, are, are doing it because they're, you know, they're paid per essay. They want to get it over with. Um, and if you bold things, if you, if you make your answer easy to read and if it's easy to organize, you know, like you kind of put it in this format for them, they will like you right off the bat. Um, so if you bold or emphasize keywords of law, if you show them you know what you're talking about without making them do that much work to find it, you're in a good position to get more points on the bar exam. Okay, I have a couple other essay tips in the in the handout. Right now I want to move on to the MBE portion of the bar exam. And are there any questions about the essay, about the essay portion so far? In the example that you just gave, mm -hmm. can you tell us which words you would have put in bold? Okay, good. The, uh, grader? Good question. And something like this you could put, um, like if you knew that you can delegate or assign Unless the initial party has a, or unless the party has a substantial interest in having the initial party perform, you could bold something like substantial interest. For the second issue, you could bold like good faith. You know, um, under Article Two, you do not need consideration; you only need good faith. A lot of people didn't say that in their essay, whether they didn't know it or they, um, you know, couldn't remember those words. But those are some of the words I would I would bold when you go through the essay. If you know your conclusions right, you can also bold your conclusion. I generally don't recommend that unless you're like confident about it. But some people do that too. They just make it very easy for the grader. So for the MBE, we'll spend about 10, 10 minutes on this. Um, and then I'll just talk briefly about a couple of JD advising services and then I will let you be. Um, of course, I'll stay after to answer questions if anyone has any. But I want to talk about some key strategies for the MBE because these are things that a lot of people are unaware of, especially first time takers when they walk into the bar exam and there's strategies that can actually really help you uh, pass the bar exam. So the first key strategy to be aware of is, and I'm saying this again, even though I've said it once because it's so important, and that is to actively review MBE topics. Some people get so obsessed with strategy they need more strategy, 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 strategy. But strategy isn't going to help you if you don't know the law well enough. Um, and the strategy, of course, can help you to a certain point, but you have to know the law. And unfortunately, the MBE and the essay portion, they don't test general principles of law. It would be great if they tested general principles of easements or general principles of you know, um, negligence, but they don't. They test the nuances and the details. So the number one way to increase your score on the MBE is to memorize the law, actively review your MBE subjects, and memorize the nuances of the law. Um, somebody walked into my office last 
exam because he kept saying, I need more strategy, you know, my scores aren't going up. And I just started quizzing him. I said, what are the four elements of a dying declaration? He had no idea. Well, how do you, what are the different ways to sever a joint tenancy? He had no idea. And after a few of these questions, I told him, you don't need more strategy. You just don't know the law well enough, you know, and you're trying to answer questions without learning the law well. I'd be frustrated too if I was trying to answer questions without knowing the law. But that's the number one way to improve your MBE score is to do the hard work of memorizing the nuances of the law. Um, secondly, spend more time on the MBE subjects that are highly tested or that are difficult for you. If you are really terrible at evidence and you love torts, you know, spend more time on evidence than you do on torts. Even if your bar review course such a schedule, you're supposed to spend you know two days on this, two days on that. You have to do what's going to help you rather than following a cookie cutter schedule. So make sure to allocate extra time on the MBE subjects you struggle with. Just like we talked about, and this is my third tip, how not all topics are tested equally in the essay portion. Some are tested more than others. It's also true with the MBE portion. So you're going to have seven MBE subjects. These seven subjects, uh, you know, and I've listed them here, torts, evidence, real property, contract, sales, crim law, crim pro, civ pro, con law, they're all tested equally. There's 25, subject, uh, 25 questions on each subject that are scored. But the topics within a subject are not tested equally. So for example, if you look at torts here, there's 25 questions, but 12 to 13 of those questions are on negligence. That's half the torts questions on negligence. And as we mentioned earlier, it's highly tested on the essay portion of the bar exam. They love negligence and premises liability on the essay portion. So you should learn negligence very well for torts. And if you are like, I have a half a day and I'm figuring out whether or not I should spend it on negligence or products liability or defamation or whatever, I would spend it on negligence because that's where the maximum number of your points are going to come from, 12 to 13 MBE points and potentially an entire essay question. So you have to study efficiently for the MBE as well. Um, if you go flip the next page, and I won't talk about all of these, I'm just going to point out a couple things. But like, if you look at real property, for example, it's very evenly tested. There's about five, section, uh, five questions in each section of real property. So what does this mean for you? It means, first of all, if you never learn the rule against perpetuities in law school, I wouldn't spend time on it for the bar exam. Um, it's one MBE question, and it has not been tested on the essay since 1991. So I wouldn't really worry about it for the Michigan Bar Exam. It's just not worth your time. Even people who struggle with present and future interests, it has not been tested on the essays in like 20 years, and it's going to be two to three questions on the MBE if that. So I tell students, I mean, of course it's important to try to learn these areas of law, but it's not like it's going to be 15 questions on the, on the MBE portion of the bar exam. So you have to study smart when you study um, you know, real property and all the MBE subjects. Focus on the highly tested topics. OK, a couple other tips. My fourth tip is to obtain released multiple choice questions. Just like when you studied for the LSAT, you use released LSAT questions, and that would help you improve your score more. If you just use questions a course made up, if you walked into the LSAT, you'd be unprepared for the types of questions you see on the exam. And it's very similar with the bar exam. Um, there are released bar exam questions out there. There's real questions out there that you can get a hold of, and you want to use these real questions when you, when you study rather than questions a course made up. To my knowledge, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but Barbary, Kaplan, and Themis do not give released questions as their primary source of questions. They give questions that they made up, um, which is fine, but those are not the best questions. So I would not use those as my primary source of studying for the MBE. Sometimes people who take a commercial course walk into the MBE and say, those questions didn't look anything like the questions I was practicing, and they get really upset by it. Um, and then they see their score improve when they start to use these real questions. So there's a couple different sources for real MBE questions, and I will tell you what they are. I like the Strategy and Tactics 6th edition. This is what we give people who take our course. Um, this is 550 released questions. It's about $80 on Amazon now, I think. You should get the 6th edition rather than like the 5th edition or 4th edition, because the 6th edition has civil procedure questions in it too. 
there are no relief civil procedure questions yet, so every civil procedure question will be made up by the author. Uh, the NCB hasn't released any civ pro questions yet. What was the name of that book again? What's that? What was the name of the book again? Uh, it's the Strategies and Tactics 6th edition. It's the very first one um, on the on the list there. It's also mandatory. You can't read it. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was, I think it's required in one of the Cooley courses, too. It's called Bar Skills. And the Bar yeah, Skills sure. course. Okay. okay. So you know. what? Uh, strategies and Tactics. It's listed as the one right here. It's got like a white and purple cover. If you're confused, just email me and say, is this the right book? And I'll tell you if it's the right book or, or I'll just send you a link on Amazon. Um, Adaptive Bar also uses release questions. So Adaptive Bar uses, um, it's expensive. It's like $400. You can do them online. So sometimes people like to do the questions online. Um, you know, they like to do on their iPhone or whatever, on their iPad. So it's good on the go. It's, it's, there's more questions. It's also more expensive. Um, somebody told me if you use the code JD Advising, you get $50 off. So if you're interested in buying Adaptive Bar, I would use that code. I think Cooley might have a code too. Yes, the reco our recording is getting ready to cut off in a few minutes. We just got the recording. Um, how are you going to send out the, the handout? How will we know to get the handout? You know, I'll send it to Audra, and then I'll have her email everyone, basically, because I'm not... Who's Audra? Who's Audra? Um, Audra Forster, she's like the... She's the campus director. The campus director. She does everything oh, here. For Auburn Hills. Oh, yeah, yeah, for Auburn Hills. So she'll, she'll find a way to get it to you guys. If you email... You can email me directly, too. Um, my email is ashley at jdadvising.com. I'll just write it on here. And I'm happy to just send you anything that you miss. If you're right, worried about you. it. Mm -hmm. How many more minutes is it? When is this going to turn off? At the five minute yeah, 2.30 exactly. Oh, okay. I'm already at the five minute war. I see. So they're, they're like strict here. Well, I should have given you well, that's okay. <laughs> um, I'm gonna just briefly. I will expire momentarily. Thirty seconds. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> it's forcing us along. Um, the very last thing I want to talk about, and there's some more multiple choice tips which you guys can read, and I'd recommend that you do. Is I want to talk about a couple of the services that we offer too, and I'll put them up on the board. You can find them online. Um, the one service I want to say in the 30 seconds we have left with, with you guys is um, we do offer a seminar at Cooley for a discounted price. So the seminar is normally $500. We go over predictions. Oh, well, there we go. We lost them. Um, we go over predictions of what's being tested on, or what will be tested on the upcoming bar exam. Last July, we actually predicted, out of the 15 subjects that were tested, we predicted what 10 of the topics would be, which is significant. We're not always that good in terms of predicting what's going to be tested. Um, it's just on the last page of this handout, which is now not showing up. So again, the Cooley students get a discounted price on that. And if you want to sign up, you know, you can sign up anytime, really. I'd recommend signing up early um, just to be safe. A couple other things that we offer too is we have a Heidemann bar prep course. I'm sure that you guys who are taking July are probably already signed up for a course. So, um, you know, and this one is full service, it's pricey. We give all, you know, our outlines are completely tailored to what's tested on the Michigan bar exam. We give all release MBE and, M, uh, and essay questions. It's 50 hours of instruction. We have a very small group of 10 people. We have a couple spots left in our night course. Um, our day course is full. We give a substantial essay feedback. Last February, we had a 100% passage rate for our students. We don't know this February because um, they have not released results yet. We're eagerly awaiting. We also have an essay-only course. This is something that I recommend that students um, do if they're, if they're worried about the essay portion of the bar exam. We tailor our essay portion completely to what's tested. So. Um, you know, we basically I go through all past answers or essay exams from 1990 to 2017. Um, I make sure that every issue that has ever been tested on the bar exam is in an essay outline, and we go over it in class together. You get a nice big book of essay outlines, which I can show you if anyone's interested. That's also pricey. It's $2,200.
$50. I generally recommend if you use it with a commercial course that you just don't go to those lectures in a commercial course and use it as a substitute for the, the Michigan-specific essay subjects, um, especially as they've been testing more of these essay subjects, these like unusual subjects recently. People walking out of the class have had very high scores on the essay portion of the bar exam, which is great. Sometimes it can make up for a lower MBE score. Um, we talked about the Michigan Bar Exam Seminar. We have a book on how to pass the Michigan Bar Exam, which I have a copy of here I can show you. It's pricey, it's $199. One thing that people like about the book and they buy the book for is it has one sheets in the back. So just like we are kind of going over each of the individual topics and like, you know, the bullet points of each of the individual topics, instead of just having that in a half a page, it has a whole sheet of them. So some people say that the book is the reason that they passed the bar exam because they just neurotically study the one sheets um, so it gives you a lot for your money. We also write bar exam appeals, which hopefully you won't need. Last administration, only six appeals passed in the state, which is low. Uh, we wrote five of those six appeals, though. And um, it's been harder and harder to successfully win an appeal, so I hope that none of you guys are in that boat where you need one. But if you do, it's another service that we offer. And we have a lot of free advice. I'm always blogging about the bar exam. I love the bar exam. So I put my website on there if you're interested in just some free advice and tips on the bar exam. So um, I guess that is it for, for me. We got cut off, Audra. <laughs> um, of course. I should just stay a half hour longer every time. <laughs> exactly. Um, do you guys have any questions about anything I talked about or anything generally? A real quick question mm -hmm. the book. Mm -hmm. How often is it updated? Um, about every three years. So we just updated it. Like I just updated it like a month ago. And we just started selling it May 1st. So we have a new edition now. Um, the old edition is still helpful though. Like, you know, a lot of the information is the same. But we did add more, like one of the things that we have in the book is five years of exams with model answers and student answers. So we added, you know, four more years worth of exams. So people like to see kind of like that aspect of the book. So the new edition is 300 pages longer than the old edition. But the only reason I updated, to be honest, I wasn't planning on it. And then I got pregnant and I said, I better update this edition before I have a baby and then I have no time at all. Um, so I'll probably update it again in another like, you know, Three or four years. No, I just so, was thinking, depending on when you're actually going to take the bar, you want the most. Yeah, yeah. Like if you're taking it in three years, I mean, you're not going to probably read it now anyway. So. Oh, okay. Well, I won't update it in the next year. <laughs> so, any other questions? Well, thanks you guys so much for 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 joining me. <laughs> what, what time of day is your um are your classes? Um, so the ones with spots left are both at night. We have a 6.30 and 8.30. A 6.30 to 8.30 is generally like the time that we meet. So our full service course starts um, like May 15th and it meets 6.30 to 8.30 most Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday nights. There's like, you know, Memorial Day and the exceptions where we'll, we'll not meet a day. Um, but basically it's 50 hours of instruction for the full service course. The essay course meets on Thursdays. So it meets Thursday evening, 6.30 to 8.30, um, and it meets seven times to go over all the essay material. Okay. And we do a lot of essay exams and grading in that course, too. So, so you're saying it's like two hours per yes. session times 25, essentially? Yes, mm -hmm. for the full course. Mm -hmm. And we give a lot of, we're pretty neurotic about our students in that class, for better or worse. We want everyone to pass. So we keep very close tabs on everyone in those courses. Well, that was another great guest this week on the Law School Insider. If you have an interest in being a guest on the show, drop me an email at lawschoolinsider at cooley, C-O-O-L-E-Y dot E-D-U. And thank you all for listening today. And remember, you have the ability and right to take control of your law school's success. I hope you'll continue listening, creating a plan for success that will prepare you to achieve the dreams that you have set for yourself. Talk to you next time. Thanks for listening. You're on your way to being a law school insider. Please subscribe to stay connected and come back again next time as we speak to more students, lawyers, and employers. Mm -hmm.